morning, everyone. I love all the chatter. It's been fun watching the church grow over the last few years. <clears throat> so, my name is Josh. I'm not the regular teaching pastor here. Um, but uh, it's good to be with you guys this morning. I wanted to give a special shout out to my brother and my sister-in-law here from Hawaii. Thank you guys for being here. Came all the way from Hawaii to hear me speak today, so thank you guys. Uh, also, uh, my wife is going to be here today, and uh, this like I think the first time in about a year that she's been in to hear the message. I feel bad that it has to be this one, since she's already heard it three times this week. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm thankful for her listening and providing feedback. So um, I've accepted the task of bringing this thing in for a soft landing. Uh, this is our Ecclesiastes Under the Sun summer series. This is going to be the last installment. And I know Chris has talked about how difficult this has been to speak on, and I realize it's difficult to listen about life being about a chasing after the wind, and we're all going to die, um, and I, I understand that, uh, but I have to say, I think it's been really beneficial. It's important to, to sit with this stuff, to understand that we're prone to fill our lives with really what amounts to just chasing after the wind. And also to remember that there are things that happen in this life that don't make sense. And that's always been the case. This book was written 3,000 years ago, and it still rings true today. But since this is the end of the series, I wanted to just briefly go over the three main points that Ecclesiastes has covered up to this point. So what we've learned from this ancient book of wisdom, number one, life is meaningless. And number two, life is mostly made up of chance. And number three, we all eventually will die. So... Those are just really so you guys can set up, set up your notes and kind of get a, an idea of where we're going. After we cover each of those points, then we're going to come to the conclusion or what the author calls the end of the matter. And it turns out when all is said and done, it comes down to two things. But you're going to have to stay tuned to the end uh, to find out what those things are. <clears throat> okay, so the first main point, life is meaningless. It's what the book opens up with. And, and meaningless is, at least, that's, that's the word that the NIV uses, in the New International Version. Some other versions say life is vanity, which I, I kind of like better somehow. But the actual Hebrew word that's being translated into both of those words is hevel. And we don't have a super clear translation for that in English, but it could probably best be translated as smoke. So something that isn't so much meaningless, but difficult to grasp. Like you can see it, it's there, you reach out for it, but you can't hold it or contain it. This is echoed in the book of James when he says, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So a very similar word picture there. And I think it's appropriate. It's like when you figure out what you think life is, its meaning can shift. And even though it's right in front of you, it seems like you're never going to catch it. And this is mentioned no less than 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, as Chris has pointed out. It's almost as if it's there to punctuate the author's main points. But this idea of hevel, of life being like smoke, it runs into the second main point of Ecclesiastes, which is that life is mostly made up of chance. So remember that Ecclesiastes is only one of the ancient wisdom literature books that we have in the Bible. So it starts with Proverbs, and then goes to Ecclesiastes, and then Job. And we in the West especially, we, we like Proverbs. It's quoted all the time because it makes sense. And it's something that we appreciate in our scientifically driven postmodern culture. So we like things to be linear, to be black and white, and Proverbs goes along with this. <clears throat> So in chapter 2, just the, one of the many examples, Proverbs says, Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. 
And then chapter 3, the wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. So you can turn to nearly any of the Proverbs and get a similar message. You do the right thing and good things happen. When you do the wrong thing, bad things happen. And we like these conditional statements or, or if-then statements. They go along with our scientific method, you know, trial and error, work things out. The same input is always going to equal the same output. But then Ecclesiastes comes along and says, well, maybe it doesn't work like that every time. So Ecclesiastes 7.15 says, In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. So it turns out there might be a glitch in the matrix. Chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes says, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So that doesn't seem right. Chapter 2, Ecclesiastes says, The fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. So the same guy in the last book in Proverbs, he's telling me that wisdom would save me from the wicked, that it would bring me honor. But now I'm getting the same outcome as the fool, and it's meaningless like everything else. So the question is, is Solomon contradicting himself, or is the Bible contradicting itself? And at first glance, you might wonder. But when you read it and sit with these things, I think you realize they're not contradictions. Rather, both books are teaching different truths. And the Bible is honest about the tension in life. All through the Bible, there's an honesty with the tension between the spirit and the flesh. That's more of a New Testament kind of idea. Or between grace and truth. Or more in the Old Testament, between mercy and justice. Between life and death. Maybe nowhere in the Old Testament is this more obvious than in Ecclesiastes. And we don't really like this. It's a little unsettling. I want to know that if I put the work in, that good things are going to happen to me. And that if I do the right thing, that my family is going to be okay. But this kind of theology can be a slippery slope. It can lead to what's referred to as works-based righteousness. And that can lead to overwhelming guilt when things go wrong. And it can lead to judgment of others when things aren't going right in their life. The third book of wisdom literature, Job, addresses the dangers of this kind of theology much more clearly Just because bad things are happening, it doesn't mean that someone isn't right with God. And conversely, just because things are going right for someone, that doesn't mean that that person isn't, uh, that that person is right with God. So there's actually a freedom in the book of Ecclesiastes and the wisdom that's presented here to know that you can't control everything. So you don't really need to try. Ecclesiastes tells us to enjoy the good gifts from God. And even though it seems like there is no difference in the end, and things happen that don't make sense, there is a right and a wrong way to live. And we need to be okay with sitting with that and trusting God with that. And we're just about to kind of get to that, to the end of Ecclesiastes. But first, I wanted to go over the final point that we've learned in Ecclesiastes. So point three is that you will die. And this is maybe the greatest reason that humans don't appreciate this book. We don't like to think about our constantly shortening lifespan. But this is your life, and it's ending one minute at a time. And this brings us to our passage for the day. So we're going to be going over the final uh, chapter in Ecclesiastes. So if you want to turn there, we'll spend the majority of the time in Ecclesiastes 12. And Chris already shared about this last week, uh, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. But Solomon does end this whole book with a final reminder that your life does have an expiration date. So Ecclesiastes 12, starting in verse 1, I'm just going to go down and read the whole chapter, and then we're going to kind of go back through it and and pick it apart a little bit. Not quite the whole chapter, most of it. In the 
uh, in the in the version that I have of the Bible, uh, this is like one long run-on sentence. So I didn't really know where to break it up. Um, but we're just going to go through it. This is all one sentence. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low, they are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. All right. <clears throat> my goodness. A lot of great language there. Uh, my favorite part is the tired grasshopper just dragging itself along. Like, that makes me tired reading it. <clears throat> so Solomon starts by saying, remember your creator. Because if you remember that you're created, that you have a beginning, then you will also have an end. And you're going to be more likely to enjoy the moments that you're given in between. But beyond that, Solomon goes on what I would call a fantastically accurate and perhaps depressing monologue about aging. So this is poetry. <clears throat> and it's stuff like this that I think makes the Bible interesting to read. Sometimes when I'm reading through the Bible, I'm like, what does that even mean? I need to have someone, like a commentary um, or someone smarter than me, just point out to me what is actually being said here. So in verse 3... The keepers of the house tremble. So this would be the things that uh, help you maintain hygiene, take care of yourself. So the house is, is your body. The arms and the hands are, are what take care of it. So they become shaky. The keepers of the house tremble. And strong men bend. So strongest muscles in your body are your back and your legs. So those things bend and you get shaky. Grinders cease because they are few. So you start to lose your teeth and it becomes difficult to eat. Those looking through the windows are dimmed, so the eyesight starts to go. One rises at the sound of a bird. Sleep is light, and it's hard to come by. And the daughters of music are brought low. So the commentary that I was reading said that the translation for this is that older people don't seem to appreciate the latest cultural trends in music, which is fair. Uh, <clears throat> they are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. Fearful of adventure or really just falling, which is very legitimate. The almond tree blossoms, so the hair gets white. Although I would argue that with the way I'm going, you should just be happy you have hair <laughs> as you get older. Um, the grasshopper drags itself along. That's my favorite line, as I said. And desire fails. So it just gets hard to do the things that you used to do or the things that uh, you used to enjoy just don't excite you as much anymore. And I'm already starting to feel some of this. So this summer, we did Summer Splash, and I was the game master. It's a very, very cool title. But I was in charge of making sure that the kids enjoyed all these games. And one of the games was a slip and slide. And I was shocked at how many of your children don't know how to do a slip and slide. These kids would get up to the end of it, and they would just kind of like lie on their bellies and just pull themselves slowly down this. They look like that tired grasshopper that Solomon is referring to. So I thought, I'm going to show them how to do this. <clears throat> and my kids are out there, my seven and three-year-old. I got to impress them. So I completely go for it, like a, a running swan dive onto wet plastic on a hard ground. And it was glorious. I flew all the way to the end. There was applause. Actually, I think there was like three kids watching. But <laughs> afterward, the next day, I tried to get up and could barely get out of bed. I was like, why am I hurting right now? Why does my hip hurt? And I know it's going to get worse. 
for six years, I was a physical therapist in a hospital. I know. At the end, there's, there's just, if you live long enough, there's just things, it just gets hard to do a lot of things. It gets hard to stand up, hard to walk, very basic things that you need help with. Um, all that to say, I can see where Solomon is going with this. And the teacher continues. <clears throat> Desire fails because man is going to his eternal home. Verse 5. The mourners go about the streets. So we're all heading to the same end. And next, Solomon talks about death with a series of some of the best metaphors I've ever heard. It says things like, Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. So the teacher is confronting the end head on here. This is his final take. It's coming to the end of his teaching. So we will die. And when we do, our bodies will turn to dust, but our spirit will return to its creator. And then again, to punctuate his point one last time, we get hevel, hevel, all is hevel. And then here it is. This is what it all comes down to. So we've, we've covered the three main points in Ecclesiastes. The author is now going to come in and close the book out with a summary of the big takeaway for the reader. So Ecclesiastes is told from an author's perspective. And Solomon is referred to in like the third person. He is the teacher or the preacher. Hoeleth is what he's named in Hebrew. And that, and that can be translated as teacher or preacher or one who gathers. <clears throat> and... At the end, the perspective switches back to the author of the book. So this is the author talking about, and he's going to give some kind of biographical information about Solomon before he kind of summarizes all the points. In verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly, he wrote the words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Here it comes. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So in the end, it turns out, the author sees that there is more to us than what is under the sun. Because there will be an eternity where everything we have ever done, good and bad, does matter to an eternal judge, and it's weighed by him. This is why we are to fear him and keep his commandments. So, as a child, I had a healthy fear of my parents. I knew they held a certain power over me, and that caused me to want to obey, or maybe to obey them even when I didn't want to. And this goes back to what Pastor Chuck was talking about. His class is going to be covering, maybe. Over time, I learned that they want what's best for me. And they had my interests at heart. So it was in my interest to obey them. And as I learned that, over time, love overcame fear. I don't walk around in fear of my parents today. And this isn't the perfect example. No human relationship could ever replace the one that we have with our Heavenly Father, obviously. But I think that there is a parallel there. Solomon himself said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Then we go to 1 John 4. It tells us that the beginning of obedience is fear, because fear has to do with punishment. But in that same chapter, John also tells us that perfect love drives out fear, and that love is made complete in us because God first loved us. This is the message of Jesus, part of the good news that he brought a thousand years after Solomon. And we can love because he first loved us. And this brings us to the close of the teaching. 
The final word in Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments. So during Solomon's time, he would have been taught by his father, David, and the Levites at the time to follow the Mosaic law or the the law of Moses. And it has roughly 613 commandments in it. So for the centuries between Moses and Jesus, people were starting to ask, so what are the top ones? Like, what are the make or break ones? And they were divided into two tiers. But a question that was starting to be asked to different rabbis is, summarize this for us, or give us the top commandments. Because it's, it's hard to keep up, so help me prioritize. And different rabbis had different answer, answers to this question. What is the greatest commandment? And if that question sounds familiar, it's because Jesus was asked this very question in Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. <clears throat> Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, so just prior to this, the Sadducees had asked a question about eternity and marriage, and Jesus had had a mic drop kind of moment. <clears throat> so the Pharisees decide that they're going to try. So the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you're reading, you might notice a double quotation from Jesus there. He's quoting the law back to this expert lawyer. The greatest commandment that Jesus refers to comes from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. This is Moses speaking. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second greatest commandment that Jesus quotes comes from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Also notice, Jesus goes beyond the question that was asked. So the question that was asked was, what is the greatest commandment? They want one. And Jesus answers directly. He gives them one, but he gives them a second one. First, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And I want to say, stop right there. Because... I can understand that, loving a perfect God who first loved me. That makes sense. But people are messy. Loving people is messy. That's tough. So why does Jesus go on? Why does he insist on saying to love your neighbor as yourself? I would argue it's because that loving God can never be just about you. Following Jesus was meant to be done in community, and we are called to actually love our neighbor. And this is backed up over and over again through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So remember, the person sitting to your right and to your left, the neighbor across the street, your coworkers, your boss, every person you find, everyone is made in the image of God. You can see them. They're right in front of you. Going back to 1 John 4, which is becoming one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, he has something to say on this as well. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. Hates a brother or sister. This one. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Jesus has quite a lot to say about this. For me, the most memorable teaching that he gives is in Matthew 25. So just a quick excerpt from this. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So this is from Jesus' sheep and goats parable, which to me is one of the most startling passages in the Bible. A brief summary, Jesus tells us that all the people of the earth will be separated into two groups at the end of all things, to be judged by himself. Those on his right are referred to as sheep, and they will be told to enter the kingdom because they gave Jesus food and water, 
when he was hungry and thirsty. They invited him in, they took care of him when he was sick, and they visited him in prison. But what's interesting about this parable is the sheep are going to be surprised. They're going to say, when did we do this? And he says, when you did it to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. And conversely, to those on the left, who are referred to as the goats, Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you, because when you didn't feed one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, when you didn't give them a drink when they were thirsty, when you didn't invite them in, when you didn't take care of them when they were sick or visit them in prison, you didn't do it for me. And I think we should pay close attention here because just like the sheep, the goats seem surprised, like they thought that they were going into the kingdom. Jesus tells us that loving our neighbor is the same as loving God, and he appears to care about this very much. And again, we listen to those we fear. And so it all comes back to this, fear God and keep his commandments. Life under the sun doesn't always add up. There's a mystery to it. But the best that we can do is to fear God, learn to love him more each day, and in the same way, love each other. So as we close, I just want to encourage you to take two steps this week. And I'm going to start with the easier of the two. If you haven't done it yet, please read Ecclesiastes. It's not a long book. It's 12 chapters. You could read it in one sitting. But I want you to think about these things and realize that your life is going to end, and at the end there will be a judgment. Are you becoming more like the goats and making decisions that only benefit yourself, or are you becoming more like sheep and learning how to take care of the people around you? Take a measure of the things that are worth pursuing in your life, things like family and friends and living in community, and just be grateful for what you have. But then the second thing I want you to do, and this is, I would argue, probably the harder ask. So how do you get to know someone better? Well, you have to listen to them. How did Solomon get to be so wise? And contrary to what I believed up until I started studying for this, he didn't ask for wisdom. 1 Kings 3 tells us that Solomon asked God for a discerning heart. And the word translated discerning here is shama, which is most often translated as to hear or to listen. So Solomon asked God for a listening heart or a heart that hears. And Jesus models this for us throughout his life. We're told that he frequently goes away to a quiet place to pray. So the, the second thing that I want you to do is to sit with Jesus and do nothing. In our go, go, go society, this is very difficult. This is a practice. We have to do this repeatedly to get good at it. So if you're anything like me, when you try to do this, you're going to be terrible at it. And you're going to sit there for about two minutes, it seems like a half hour, and your mind's going to wander, and you're going to start thinking about all the things you have to do, and you're going to go want to do those things. (laughs) But, like I said, it's a practice. It requires repetition. So you have to come back, try again, and again, and again. And as you do, you'll learn how to quiet your heart and listen. And if we can learn how to do that, how to listen to God, it's going to make it easier for us to listen to our neighbor or to listen to the people around us and to find out how we can help them. So I was struggling with how to close this. I thought I would just close in prayer like usual. And then I thought, maybe we could do like a time of silence, which could be very awkward. <clears throat> so, but then I thought about all the Quaker meetings that I had to sit through as a child, and I had to sit there for 60 minutes in silence, and I thought, we can handle two minutes. So I know, I've, I've asked for us to do this before, and I'm going to do it to end this. I'd just like us to sit for two minutes in silence. If you could just turn your phones off. This is a tough thing to do. I understand that. Believe me. Um, But I do think that if we could learn to silence our hearts and hear the voice of God, and if we could learn how to sit silently while someone else is talking to us and really hear what they have to say and what's on their heart, that we would be able to love better. And so I would just ask that for two minutes, maybe one minute, see how it's feeling, um, For a minute or two, we're just going to sit in silence, and then I'll come up and the ministry team can come up, and then I'll close us with an out loud prayer.
Uh, an interesting story I heard about Mother Teresa. Uh, Dan Rather was interviewing her, and he asked her, well, when you pray to God, what do you say? And she said, well, I don't say anything. I listen. And he said, well, well what does God say? And she said, well, nothing. He listens. And it, if you can't understand that, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> so I would just ask for us to just start our practice here with a minute or two of silence, and then I'll close us. If the ministry team could come forward. Thank you, guys. Father, I just thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word that's always teaching us. I pray that you would keep our hearts soft and that we would have a listening heart that is able to listen to you, that is able to be quiet and hear the people around us, that you would give us eyes to see the people around us the way that you see them, and that you would give us the ability to be courageous as we go out from here into our spheres of influence. I pray that we would see things the way that you see them, and that your word would settle into our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to come forward for prayer, these amazing people are up here, please do so. Otherwise, you're free to go.